for today and for this week. Yeah. We have plenty of time because Atish could not make it because of the visa. So ah, okay. if you feel like you need to go over time, we have, for example, one slot after yours, which is free. So we are going to ah, okay. put you had the discussion. same for tomorrow and after tomorrow and after ah, tomorrow. Okay. We, have a separate, we have two classrooms in the afternoon, so we can split the room if, you know, if we want to do that. No, no, I, no. I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just telling you. Yeah, okay, yeah no, no, but no, let's not split no, no, just the blackboard, yeah. Okay, I'm uh, ready to start. Okay, so let's start. It's a pleasure to have Juan telling us about entanglement. And yeah, so yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. So I will be taking off from where Mark Van Ransog will have left. <laughs> and <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm I'm joking. I I will. The the numbers were because my deck we swapped, and initially he was talk, going to talk the first week, and I was going to talk the third week, but uh, now we have the other order. So I will start with the more basic uh, things. So, of course, uh, you all know information is very important. And you know that, uh, for example, Jan Shannon's thinking of classical information was very useful for understanding thermodynamics in a, in a new way. Um, and of course, quantum mechanics uh, now will have to do with quantum information. And all physical theories, in some sense, are processing information in some way. You give some information about the experiment you are trying to do, and then you get some information out. So they are about information. Now one could go over the top and say that physics is information. That might be true, but uh, we don't know. Uh, certainly our physical theories have a little more input on how precisely we uh, process this information. And, but something that has been very productive and useful is, uh, has been to think about the constraints uh, that information places on physical theories. Of course, the concept, concept of entropy is a very clear example of that. Um, but thinking more specifically about quantum information and how quantum information is stored in uh, relativistic quantum field theory and also in quantum gravity uh, has been it's very important. And um, understanding it in detail uh, has led to some progress. And so my talks will be mainly about this topic, so how quantum information is stored uh, in the theories we know about, in the theories of relativistic quantum field theory. And first, I'll talk just about the case of relativistic quantum field theory. And then we'll talk a bit more about uh, quantum gravity. Um, so examples of, um, of uh, results, con very well, concrete results that have been obtained uh, using this thinking of how quantum information is encoded in uh, relativistic field theories are, for example, the C and F, uh, C uh, and F theorems. Um, then um, going to the case of gravity, so thinking about uh, clearly about the black hole information problem uh, requires you to understand if you're going to solve the quantum information, black hole quantum information problem, you need to understand some details of uh, how um, quantum information is stored, and maybe by thinking about those details, you can even rule out some scenarios. Okay, um, and um, quantum information if, or in the constraints of information might have something to do with the emergence of gravity, and uh, it, certainly information uh, constrains the organization of the state. So it's important. Um, so states in uh, quantum field theory are organized according to the normalization group flow. And thinking um, about this in the quantum mechanical in a quantum mechanical way um, um, involves understanding how quantum information is stored in the state, and this has been fruitful to to try to understand. Okay, so well, physics from information. Well, I said that you can go over the top and say that physics is all about information. Um, I will not do that. So, but on the other hand, um, if you um, there seems to be some indication that uh, thinking about gravity, for example, in terms of uh, the Lagrangian as we usually think of, or thinking in terms of 
giving a formula. So La Lagrangian gives you a formula for the dynamics of the theory. And um, you can alternatively give a formula for the entanglement entropy, so a concept I'll discuss later. But uh, the area formula for the entanglement entropy seems to uh, give rise to the same equations that the Einstein-Lagrangian gives rise to. So I'll dis this might uh, be more in Ma Van Ranslong's lectures. Maybe I'll say a few things about that. Um, and that's not a complete uh, equivalence yet, but uh, something that might develop into a complete equivalence in the future. Now, regarding this issue of whether uh, whole physics is information, I encourage you to read Wheeler's article uh, on uh, Eat from Bit, if you've never read it. So, um, but I don't have anything new to say. But uh, if you want something over the top, you can read that. Uh, he has uh, this picture of a big U. This is the universe. It's very small in the beginning and big here. And we are here looking at the universe. And uh, we create it by the things we look. So the beginning of the universe is because we ask questions. We have questions about the universe. And by the questions we ask, we create what we see. That's, um, for me, maybe over the top. But maybe that's what will feature, will develop. Suddenly, Wheeler was right about, uh, Wheeler was right about many things. And uh, <laughs> so maybe he's right about this, too. Um, OK. Um, so but the first, uh, um, so what we'll, di we'll discuss here will be mostly, at least in the very beginning, will be mostly about entropy, um, about computing various kinds of entropy um, and properties of entropy, of quantum entropy, and uh, mainly uh, of subregions, so mainly entropy of subregions in quantum field theory. Should I write bigger or everyone can see? Uh, and also the concept of so-called relative entropy. I'll so that I'm just giving entropy. Um, and then how it, this can be used in quantum field theory, uh, quantum field theory and gravity. So that will be the topic of uh, these first uh, few lectures. And depending on how we go, we might say some other things. So first, uh, I'll talk about some basic concepts and relations. So basic uh, concepts and properties of uh, relative entropy and so on, and entropy, quantum entropy. And um, a, a reference or a book you might want to read on this is one by o Oya, sorry, Oya and Pets. It has all the, it's a book. So it's called uh, Quantum Entropy, Quantum Entropy and its use, and contains many of the things. And if you want uh, some um, something online, you can find uh, a review by Bedral, which is uh, uh, has this number. It's also a nice review. Um, okay. So um, now, in quantum mechanics, the basic uh, the basic concept is uh, the density matrix. So normally, uh, in all these books, when they talk about the state, they typically think about this, the density matrix. And in the particular case that the state is pure, uh, that can, um, then we have uh, that row is equal to psi psi. So normally, in quantum mechanics, we think of uh, psi as the state vector. Um, but you might, in these books, read that. Uh, the state is really specified by density matrix, and that's the more general description of the state. Um, um, okay. So um, then, uh, once you get the density matrix, there is a notion of entropy, um, uh, which is the von, Neum von Neumann entropy, which is minus trace uh, of uh, rho log rho. Um, and this von Neumann entropy is a measure of uh, how much you don't know about the quantum state of the system. I mean, of course, in quantum mechanics, you cannot know everything. Um, so even if you had the state with its complete characterization like this psi, you cannot predict the outcome of some experiment, right? You still have some randomness. But um, this uh, von Neumann entropy measures the extra randomness that you have beyond the one you have in quantum mechanics. Okay, so you can. 
uh, if you had a pure state, then uh, this uh, entropy defined this way would be zero. Um, and then you have determined your state as much as you can determine it uh, by the rules of quantum mechanics. Um, OK, so and of course, this uh, formula, when rho is a diago diagonal uh, matrix, reduces to the usual uh, Shannon entropy, so it's, uh, which is uh, sum over i pi log of pi. And I'm sure you've seen both of these formulas in your courses on statistical mechanics. Um, of course, in this case, uh, for this particular state, s is equal to 0. Um, okay, so now uh, another concept that uh, will be useful is uh, the concept of uh, relative entropy. So here in this case, uh, we're given two, uh, two states or two density matrices. So we have rho and sigma, OK? So we could have the system described by density matrix rho and the system described by density matrix sigma. And this uh, concept called the relative entropy depends on both uh, density matrices. Um, and it's by definition, so this is just the definition, uh, is trace of um, rho log rho uh, minus rho log sigma. Okay. So uh, these are matrices, so this uh, rho and sigma do not commute, so this is defined in this uh, particular way. Um, but of course, uh, you can calculate the logarithm of the density matrix, then multiply by rho, and actually compute this, this quantity. And um, now, it might be that uh, you get infinity, so it, th there is a possibility to get infinity here if, uh, for example, Sigma has a zero eigenvalue at the position where rho has a non-zero eigenvalue, right? For example, imagine they are diagonal. Even when they are diagonal, you can have the possibility that you have an infinity, okay? And well, in that case, we define it as infinite, so no, no problem. Um, okay, so that's a definition. And in order to gain some intuition about the definition, uh, one can uh, think of uh, the particular case where uh, sigma is uh, equal, uh, I'm not going to write down the normalization constant, of course, this, this density matrices are normalized, so that, uh, yeah, perhaps I should have uh, said already here that we always have that trace of rho is equal to, to 1, okay? Yeah? Maybe a very silly question. Is there only one stigma on the right-hand side of this? Uh, yeah, I should also have emphasized that. This is not symmetric and their interchange of rho and sigma. There's only one sigma. Okay. That, that's a good question. Um, and um, so the next remark will try to make that a little more natural. So imagine the particular case where sigma is proportional to e to the minus beta h. So it would be the sigma that corresponds to a thermal system, right? So you imagine you have a thermal system. And uh, so in this particular example, in this par for this particular case, then uh, s, s of rho and sigma just becomes equal to the difference in uh, free energy. The difference in free energy between the state characterized by rho and the state characterized by sigma. And you can, you can check this, so in other words. So you'll have, um, so, you'll have um, so the free energy is E minus T times S. So there is a term uh, that involves uh, the expectation value of the energy, um, and that's, uh, this first term, right? So this first term is the, so here when sigma is that particular expression, then this logarithm of sigma becomes just h, right? Minus h. This minus becomes a plus, and that's the expectation value of the energy, right? So that's the energy term. So let me call it the expectation value of the energy. Um, and uh, then uh, this term is just uh, minus uh, the entropy. Right up to well, there are factors of beta. I'm setting to one, but uh, so there is a beta here. Um, so this is beta e minus s. So that's in the state characterized by rho. And then uh, you 
can subtract the same things in the state character as by sigma, right? And those terms uh, really give you essentially zero uh, once you normalize this sigma properly, okay? So we, if we normalize this sigma properly, then there would have been an extra term here that would not have been the Hamiltonian exactly, but there would be an extra shift. And that shift is precisely canceled by evaluating E minus t, per, t, t times s with this particular uh, density matrix. Is that clear? No? Should I do this uh, more explicitly, or maybe you can do it as an exercise too? Should I do it or not? No. Yeah. So you can do it as an exercise. Um, now, from, uh, so the point is that uh, now this expression really uh, is the expression for the difference in free energy that you would have for a system whose equilibrium state would be given by sigma, right? So if you had such a Hamiltonian, if you are able to choose whatever Hamiltonian you want to pick, you can choose a Hamiltonian such that the Hamiltonian is the logarithm of this sigma. And uh, then uh, this expression would be just that difference in free energy uh, for the Hamiltonian you've chosen. Um, and that's, uh, so that's the case. Now from this discussion, it suggests that, um, well, wh what should be the, the row that minimizes this relative entropy? What would be the row that uh, minimizes this difference in free energy? Yeah, that's right. So the equilibrium state is the one that minimizes the free energy. And so you expect that if you take any other state, the free energy should be bigger. Um, and uh, therefore, the uh, the row that would minimize this would be equal, exactly equal to sigma, and um, and so on. So, in fact, you can actually you can prove that uh, for uh, any uh, density matrices, so S of uh, rho and sigma is uh, bigger or equal than zero for any two. It can, I re recall that sometimes it can be infinite, but that's fine. That's consistent with this inequality. Uh, it's always bigger or equal than zero, and it's equal to zero when rho is equal to sigma. Um, and it's not, so you can somewhat easily show it for diagonal density matrices, and if you think about it a little more, you can also show it for non-diagonal uh, density matrices. Um, now, Okay, so a property that uh, is uh, sometimes used related to this is uh, the the first law. So there is a, so you know the first law of thermodynamics that says that the change in entropy is equal to uh, the change of uh, the change in energy, right, up to a factor of beta. And you can think of that as just uh, demanding that the free energy is minimal. So when we just make a small displacement, we can only increase the free energy. Therefore, any small change to first order should not change the free energy. And to higher order, it should only increase the free energy. Right? So if we think of uh, this as a function of rho, so in the space of all possible rows, of course, that's a very multidimensional space. So we have sigma here. And so here, uh, we'll have a minimum. And uh, then it should uh, increase. And that implies that uh, we make a small variation. So if we change uh, rho, if rho is equal to sigma plus some um, delta rho, then uh, we will have that, um, that delta s, so the, the difference in entropy. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll have that. Um, um, what we will have is that uh, this. Uh, due to the fact that it's minimal, uh, first order variation of this should be zero. And this is the entropy minus uh, the energy in where the Hamiltonian is essentially given by the log of sigma. Right? Um, and this is sometimes uh, written as uh, delta s is equal to beta. Well, people sometimes put here a factor of 2 pi. Ignore the factors of 2 pi if you don't like them. Times k um, times delta k. Um, where k is uh, just the Hamiltonian. So usually in this context, um, people um, define uh, matrix k, which uh, 
uh, which is just simply the logarithm of sigma. Just this is just by definition the logarithm of sigma, and it's uh, called the modular Hamiltonian. I didn't invent the name. Uh, I don't know why it's. So it's basically the Hamiltonian uh, that would correspond to viewing sigma as a thermal density matrix. And by convention, we choose the temperature to be 2 pi. So ignore the factors of 2 pi if you don't like them. Um, but this is, uh, this is sometimes called the entanglement first law, or should be called the, uh, this relative entropy first law. Um, it becomes an entanglement first law when we get rho and sigma for think from thinking about entanglement, and we'll come that to that later. But this is a relationship that uh, has been used. It's been useful, um, and perhaps I should uh, also rewrite this relation. So the relation that says that this is positive can also be rewritten as uh, saying that uh, again two pi uh, delta of the let's say expectation value of this k is uh, bigger or equal than delta of s, where this delta is uh, an arbitrary difference, no, not an infinitesimal difference, but an arbitrary difference. This is just the same as this equation for the free energy. The difference in free energy, I've just, so we said that this was bigger or equal than 0. And I've, all I've done is to reshuffle the terms in such a way that we get this relationship. Um, so these are completely general relationships. and. Um, OK, so um, this relative entropy should be thought of as some kind of distance between, um, between rho and, and sigma. So it's, sometimes people call it a distance. It's not very good to think of it as a distance, because it's not symmetric. So distances are normally symmetric. But if you read the reviews, they call it a distance. Probably not a good name. So maybe I shouldn't even say that. I shouldn't call it a distance. So it's a measure. Measure of the distinguishability or the distinguishability of between rho and sigma. Um, so imagine that um, imagine that you are looking at uh, a system, some random system, and um, you are trying to guess what the the, let's do this classically first. So let's imagine we have a classical system, um, which consists of, uh, you know, there are some variables. For example, a coin that I can toss. And it can be either uh, heads or odds. And I, I'm try, trying to figure out what the probabilities are. So what the me method for determining the probability is to um, toss the coin n times, right? And then uh, say that the probability of uh, the coin having the value i, so Value i means up or down. In this case, there are only two values, right? Will be equal to the number of times, so number of times uh, that i appears appears divided by n, right? So it's just the frequency of the i-th result in a specific throw of the coins so that we threw the coin n times. Okay. So that's one thing you could do, and that defines some pi. Um, and in this way, we get some pi. But imagine that the true distribution of the coin was not the pi that we got in this particular instance when we did the experiment with n times, but it was actually qi. Okay. Right. Um, so the idea is that um, the so you, you would like to ask, well, how easy? Is, so you, um, of course, if uh, we would like to understand how uh, unprobable the result pi different from qi would be. Okay? And you can calculate uh, how unprobable that result would be. You can uh, think about this. And it turns out that the probability of uh, getting a particular qi upon throwing the coin n times is uh, going to be proportional to precisely this uh, relative entropy uh, of uh, P and Q. Okay, so Q is the true distribution. P is uh, something that could have come out of doing it ten times. Um, and this, um, sorry, I forgot the factor of n here. Okay. So if you throw in n times, uh, then the uh, 
the probability of getting confused between uh, p and q will start decreasing, right? As you throw it more and more times, you will, will be less likely to be confused. Okay. Now it's asymmetric, um, and um, okay. So let's try to understand uh, this formula a little more and why it is asymmetric. Um, um, and so imagine that p is equal to a fair coin. So this is usually. And Q is equal to so this has probably that means that the probability is one half one half okay for the up or downs and then Q is an unfair coin so Q is a completely unfair coin so always heads so Q is equal to one zero okay that's too small okay well. Um, Okay, so first one is an unfair. This part, last part, was too small. Yeah, yeah but I should get trained to. It looks big to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, so suppose we have these two uh, cases, right? So then um, now in this case, you can go back to the formula, and um, what what do you what do you see that? Um, What's what's S for this case? What's relative entropy? Infinity, I hear. Yeah. So in this case, it is infinity. So let's try to understand this infinity. So this is saying that I will never ever ever confuse this p if the true distribution is q. Okay. I will I will never ever get this p. Okay. So what, what does it mean to get this p? It means that you threw the coin n times, uh, and half the time was heads, and half the time was, was uh, tails, right? But if the true distribution is always heads, it's impossible to get half the time uh, the wrong value, tails, OK? So that uh, explains why it's infinite, and why it's reasonable that we get uh, this infinity. Um, now uh, we can do the other example. Uh, let's, uh, so we could do. P uh, is an un the unfair, right? Heads and Q is uh, even. Uh, Q is fair coin. Okay. So what do we get for relative entropy in this case? Well, this is a little more complicated. Well, if, if you do it, you can do it as an exercise, and you will get log two. Okay, um, and we get here. So in this case, in this particular case, this probability will be one to the two to the n. Okay. So now let's uh, check that uh, this is reasonable, right? So let's say we have a fair coin, right? So we have a fair coin that has the same probabilities of being head, heads or tails, and you threw it n times, and it turned out that the n times uh, showed up heads, right? So what's the probability of that? That's 2 to the minus n, and that's indeed what this formula is saying. So you might get to the wrong conclusions about the, the, the probability distribution with this very small probability. OK, very good. So that's, um, uh, that's just this definition. I, I said this in detail just so that we understand the definition, and also because this is usually said in the wrong way, the wrong order. Um, uh, not usually, maybe some people said in the wrong word. Um, okay, so now, um, so enough with the relative entropy. Now, uh, subsystems, okay? Uh, so imagine that. Uh, let me see. Well, so first uh, let's talk about entropies of uh, subsystems.
So that's um, so. In this case, we um, a simple situation for this is to imagine that uh, H is some Hilbert space where uh, we take it to be a direct product of two uh, Hilbert spaces for subsystems A and B. And this will be the structure of the Hilbert space if you imagine that you have two spatially, let's say, separated systems, like a bunch of spins here, um, physical spins here, and another bunch of physical spins on their side. So here, the full Hilbert space is the direct product of the two Hilbert spaces. So you should imagine as two decoupled systems, or that are initially uh, separated in space, um, or separated because they don't interact, or whatever reason they are separated. And then um, we can think of the Hilbert space in this way. And if we can separate the Hilbert space in this way, we can uh, take the original density matrix that is uh, a matrix in the original Hilbert space, and um, we can calculate a reduced density matrix, rho A, um, which comes from taking the trace over the subpart of the Hilbert space HA of the original density matrix rho. Okay. Um, is, is it clear how we are defining this? Should I Have you seen this definition before, or should I go through it a little more in detail? Who wants me to go through in detail through this definition? It's important you, it's crystal clear to you what we are doing when we do this. Yes or no? Who wants more details? No one wants to say they want more details. OK. OK, good. So um, how do we do this? So we choose a basics EI of the Hilbert space here. And let's say WJ. So these are some states uh, in the two Hilbert spaces. The states of this Hilbert space are labeled, we can choose a basis, which is EI times WJ, right? where I runs from 1 to the dimension of A, J runs from 1 to the dimension of B. Okay? The dimension of this is the sum of the dimensions. No, the product of the dimensions. Right? The dimension of this is the product of the dimensions of A times B. Um, and so the density matrix then, normally density matrix has two indices, alpha and beta. But in this case, each index alpha is really these two indices, right? So we have rho of i uh, and j, and i prime and j prime, OK? So that's uh, the total density matrix. We can, after we write it in these spaces, it will have this index structure. Um, this is a density matrix in subsystem A. So this should have, uh, which indices should it have? I or J or alpha? Who thinks the indices of this density matrix should be J? And I? Oh, yeah, the problem is I. I <laughs> good, good, there, I, we are paying attention. <laughs> uh, I really needed to give more details because I wrote the wrong formula. <laughs> Um, OK, so uh, indeed, we have indices i and j. Um, sorry, i and i prime. And this is uh, the sum over j of rho i, i prime, um, uh, sorry, i j, i prime j. OK? Maybe I wrote it too small. but So it's i, i. I, I prime, those are the indices of the Hilbert space A, and we're just summing over the B1. Is that uh, visible to everyone? Um, OK. Um, now, we'll, we'll, continue, we'll continue discussing these entropies of subsystems, but um, I would uh, like to now uh, make a point regarding relative entropy, so a particular inequality that is uh, very important and somewhat difficult to prove. Um, so I, I will not prove it. Um, which is that um, if you start uh, from two density matrices, rho and sigma, um, so now we'll combine the two concepts. So we had two factors in the Hilbert space. And we'll go back to relative entropy where we have two density matrices. Um, 
And, um, and now from these two density matrices, we can construct uh, through tracing out B, the density matrices rho A and, um, and sigma A, OK? Um, so these were the density matrices that we have if we look at the whole system, right? Um, and now we uh, have the density matrices of just a subsystem, so sus this is subsystem A. And we could calculate the corresponding relative entropies, uh, rho A, sigma A, smaller or equal, oh, sorry. And we can compare this to the relative entropy of uh, rho and sigma. And the important thing is the inequality between these two. Now, recall just to, remem to remember which direction the inequality goes. Um, relative entropy is a measure of how different the two states are, right? Now, if you only look at a subsystem, right, let's say uh, at the part of the state, part of the degrees of freedom, do you think they are going to be more or less distinguishable? Less, yes? So everyone will think there will be less, and indeed that's uh, what happens, and you can prove this uh, inequality mathematically, so giving more credence to the idea that this is a good measure of the distinguishability of rho and sigma. Um, Okay, so this is this is a this is an important inequality that um, <coughs> is quite non-trivial uh, to prove in uh, for non-commuting matrices, and um, and there are other others that uh, derive from it. So we'll discuss the others uh, later. Um, but I guess that intuitively should be true. It's uh, clear. Um, okay, so now we go back to the discussion of uh, the entropies of subsystems. And um, let's uh, discuss. So imagine that rho is uh, a pure state, right? So rho could be pure. But if we. Okay, so let's consider the following situation. So imagine that you have a bunch of spins. So this is subsystem A and subsystem B are here. Two separated, let's say, some spins here, some spins over there. And we have some rho in the total Hilbert space, which is pure, so the entropy is zero. Um, um, so then can we, um, if we compute the entropy of subsystem A, could that be non-zero? Oh, sorry. First I need to define what entropy of subsystem A is. So the entropy of subsystem A is just the form and entropy of the density matrix of uh, associated to subsystem A, right? So we have we start with the full um, density matrix, and this is defined even if uh, rho wasn't pure. So in general, so this is a general definition, whether rho is pure or not. So you can um, define the entropy associated to uh, subsystem A as the trace of this reduced density matrix defined in this way. Okay. Um, similarly, we could define the entropy of subsystem B, which is uh, a similar construction, but where we now trace out subsystem A, and we keep subsystem B. Um, and sometimes the total entropy of the density matrix rho, sometimes we are going to write it as A union B, um, okay, so that we put together the spins in subsystem A and subsystem B. Okay, we define this as A union B. Um, usually, uh, also in relativistic quantum field theory, usually we're going to take A to be a subregion of space, um, and then it becomes really the union of the regions uh, geometrically. Uh, but, well, in general, it's the union of the two, and this is just the usual entropy uh, that we defined before for the density matrix row, or original density matrix row. Um, so now um, there are a bunch of inequalities that hold. Um, Okay, so one is um, this uh, subadditivity property, which says that um, 
Well, first of all, let, let, first let, let's do an example and then we'll discuss the inequality. Um, so if, if rho is pure, then um, the entropy SA might still be non-zero. So you could have a situation where this entropy is non-zero, even though rho is pure, right? When, what's an example of a situation like this? EPR, yes. So if you have two spins in uh, an EPR pair, then the, this entropy will be log two for each, each of the spins, but the total entropy would be zero. Okay. Um, and then, um, well, so that's, uh, that was an example. Uh, and in these cases where rho is pure and we have a non-zero entropy, we assign this entropy to entanglement. So this entropy can only arise from entanglement, entanglement. And it is sometimes called entanglement entropy. So when the original row was pure, this SA of a subsystem is sometimes called entanglement entropy. But of course, if uh, row initially was not pure to start with, well, it could have been uh, this SA might arise just from classical correlations. They don't have to arise uh, through entanglement. Um, um, now, since this is sometimes called entanglement entropy, people then sometimes call everything, entropies of subsystems, always entanglement entropy, especially in the physics, uh, high energy, recent high energy uh, theory literature. So you should be aware that it's not exactly what sometimes advertised. Um, um, okay, so there is the von Neumann entropy of subregions defined in this way. Uh, when rho is pure, then we can think of that as entanglement entropy. Okay. Now, suppose that you have these two systems A and B. Um, if rho is pure, what do you expect to be the relationship between SA and SB? Yeah, so in that case, they will be equal. And in general, there is a, a relationship that says that S a union B, uh, this would be zero for a pure state, but it might be non-zero for a non-pure state, is bigger or equal than S A minus S B, right? bigger or equal than the difference, right? So this inequality says that if this was pure and this is zero, then indeed S A is equal to S B, but the generalization of that intuition to the uh, non-pure case is uh, this inequality that you one can prove. Um, and also there is uh, an inequality which says that SA plus SB is bigger or equal than this, right? And one way to intuitively think about these inequalities, so you can think of A and B. Uh, I don't think this intuition translates into mathematical proof, but so you can have things that are entangled between A and B and things which are entangled between uh, the outside world, right? And if you think about uh, this entropy as, as counting the number of lines that you cut, then you get this type of inequalities. Um, OK. Now we can Now, as, as we saw in this diagram, so we, so SA might be non-zero because the uh, there is entanglement with some external system, right? Um, and um, but, but it could also be because there is some correlation between A and B, right? And there is a, a good uh, there is some measure which is called mutual information. Mutual information which is a measure of the correlation between A and B. So it's called, denoted by A and B. This, is, this now is symmetric between A and B, uh, and is SA plus SB minus SA union B. And by the inequality we wrote there, that's always bigger or equal than zero. Um, and this is basically the 
um, yeah, it's the correlation. It could be quantum correlation or classical correlation. So it could be that um, um, you have a mixed state, but um, so you have coins that you throw, and when you throw, the, the coins are up in one side, they are down in the other side, completely classical. But that will give rise to a mutual information of this type. Um, OK, so one cool thing about this uh, mutual information is that uh, it uh, bounds correlators. So it's related to it. Uh, correlators in the following way. So imagine that uh, we have, again, these two subsystems. And we have an operator OA in system uh, subsystem A, and an operator OB in sus subsystem B. Um, then we can form the, so the, these operators will have some expectation values in each of the, uh, of course, since it, they, they act on uh, subsystem A. Uh, whenever I write expectation values, we are imagining we are doing trace of row O, right? And since this acts only on subsystem A, we could also write it as trace of row A, O A. Okay. It's too small again. Yeah, it gets smaller when you get further. It's just <laughs> <that> <laughs> um, yeah, it's this angle effect. Okay. Um, I think we are discovering a new law of physics here. <laughs> Um, very good. So now I'm go we are going to consider the connected correlation functions. So OA, OB connected, which are just simply the correlations, the really true correlations between A and B, where we subtract the expectation value of, of A and the expectation value in B. Okay? So that's the connected correlator. And the nice inequality is um, that um, this correlator can essentially be no bigger than the mutual information. Um, so, so if you take uh, OA, OB, connect it, you take the square of this. But you need to divide, of course, you can always rescale the operator by some constant. So that we need to rescale, rescale out. So we'll define a norm of an operator uh, to be the maximum eigenvalue. So that's uh, the norm of the operator. It's similar for OB. So all these are things that are well defined in systems of uh, finite number of degrees of freedom. Of course, if you have a field operator in quantum field theory, it's, it's not, uh, well, We'll discuss that case when we come to it. Um, so this is less or equal than the mutual information between A and B. Okay. And again, all, all these things are uh, relatively easy to prove once you find the right trick. And uh, in those reviews, they're discussed. Um, OK, so this is some, these are some of the basics of uh, entanglement and uh, quantum entropy and so on. And there are many other things that one could say that I will not say. Uh, one could uh, discuss Bell inequalities and how to make sure that uh, they are or not obeyed. Um, when, we have, when we divide the system into more than two parts, then the characterization of entanglement is a little more subtle, and I'm not going to discuss it. Uh, and another thing I'm not going to discuss is that some of this can be phrased not uh, so much in terms of dividing the Hilbert space, but in terms of the operator algebra and thinking about algebras and subalgebras and so on, and assigning uh, entropies to these algebras. And again, I won't uh, discuss it from that point of view, but those are other topics I'm not discussing. Okay. So now we'll. Uh, so all these were pre preliminaries. Now we'll get to applying uh, many of these ideas to quantum field theories. And to apply them to quantum field theories, there are many subtleties. Um, and uh, the first one is that, um, well, the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional in quantum field theory, and, and so on. And we'll try to deal with these subtleties. Uh, we'll, and despite, despite some of these subtleties, there are non-trivial statements that you can make. Um, 
Um, so some of these, mo most of these inequalities are, re I mean, are proven for uh, finite systems, so subsystems of finite systems. But in many cases, you can also prove them for subsystems of uh, infinite systems, of infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. It's a little more subtle, but it has also been done for many of these uh, entropy inequalities. Our, yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, so separate, yeah, separable, separable Hilbert spaces, but infinite dimensional. Um, um, so they've been proven, uh, but we, we will, uh, the, the approach we'll take is that will, and that has been taken, that's been useful, is to think about the continuum field theory by first uh, doing a lattice regularization, so that uh, uh, if you choose, uh, in many cases that will reduce to finite dimensional Hilbert space. And uh, then you apply these formulas with finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Sometimes you also need to discretize the target space and so on, right? Because even a harmonic oscillator has an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So sometimes you need to cut off with some energy cutoff and so on to get the finite dimensional Hilbert space. Um, okay, so, so now we're going to start talking about entanglement or uh, entanglement in uh, quantum field theory. Um, and the main, uh, the main point is that uh, in quantum field theory, you uh, can, um, can yeah, go ahead. So in the quantum mechanics example, is any of these entropies more physical than the other? Has it been more ah, very good question. Yeah, I, th I thought I was putting this. Um, one, one feature of this, uh, this entropy discussions and entanglement entropy is that which is, I, I feel it's an uncomfortable feature, is that entropy is not something directly measurable. Um, and the, the point is the following, that anything that is directly measurable is some operator O, okay? And then the results of O or the expectation value of O are computed, for example, by uh, computing the expectation value uh, with some density matrix. Um, but the entropy is, uh, and the properties of any operator of this kind is that it's linear in the density matrix, right? But entropy is uh, non-linear in the, in the density matrix, right? So if, uh, so it looks a bit like an expectation value of something, but it's really something non-linear, so it's really not an expectation value, right? And so in order to determine entropy, you would have to somehow determine the density matrix and then compute this log. Um, now, of course, in thermodynamics, we use entropy. So you could say, well, I mean, experimentalists measure entropy with no problem. There is, there is no problem. But how do they measure entropy? They measure entropy using the first law of thermodynamics. So they start uh, from the system, the system they have. They lower the temperature. They see how much heat comes out at each temperature. They divide uh, the heat divided by the temperature. They sum this up. They go to zero temperature. And that's how they determine the entropy of a system, right? at least in principle. Um, so that's, um, that's how you do it in, in principle. And uh, here you could imagine for a big system doing something like this. Uh, but that's something that you cannot do somehow for a system with a finite number of degrees of freedom. You have to repeat the system many, many times and do this. Uh. Um, anyway, so that's an uncomfortable feature of uh, this entanglement entropy. But many nice results have been obtained by thinking about entanglement entropy. So it's been so far mostly a theoretical tool because it's cool from the theoretical point of view. It's, uh, as we said, difficult to measure. Or, well, if you take this very in principle point of view, it's impossible to measure. Um, but uh, nevertheless, it's been useful theoretically. Now, what, what should you think in a situation like this? Maybe this is the wrong thing to focus on. Um, um, but if you, if you dismiss it completely, you are throwing away all the nice theoretical results you derive from it. Um, maybe there is some other quantity closely related that is more physical. Um, I, I feel in some sense that relative entropy is a little more physical. Notice the cl close connection to the first law of entanglement and, and so on. Um, and um, yeah, so maybe there is something better. Maybe there is some way to measure it. It's, people have proposed indirect ways of measuring them, but they are not very general. Um, No, no, the, no, what I did is, so I, I, def, I define the, so I, one defines the relative entropy, 
And one notices that if you do a small variation of rho, then the, because it's always bigger or equal than zero, and zero for rho equal to sigma, then for a first order variation, it's always stationary, it's always zero. So it's not a definition, it's something that follows from the definition and the properties of the, yeah. Um, I mean, follows trivially, you can uh, immediately check, check, check it please, just exercise. Check that, I mean, you take that definition, you take rho equal to, um, let's see, is it still written there somewhere? No, I erased it, okay. Um, just check it from the explicit definition. And if you try to check it, you, you will see it doesn't work unless you demand that trace of delta is zero, because you know you need to keep the trace of rho equal to one, um, or sigma equal to one. Anyway, so um, okay, so that's the point of it. This uh, being mostly theory. Um, so in quantum field theory, we can have. Uh, so one, one, property, one important property of quantum field theory is that we cannot localize particles. So if we have, let's say, something like a single particle state, can we say that this single particle is localized within this uh, very small region or not? And well, of course, approximately we can, right? In, in practice, we can certainly localize these boxes here and not somewhere else. Um, but if we go to very short distances, then this is uh, not possible. And we go to distances smaller than the uh, Compton wavelength of the particle. Because we try to measure the particle, we create more particles and so on. And so we cannot really localize particles. We cannot say a particle is localized to a very small region of space. Um, but what we can localize in quantum field theory are operators. So operators are local. Um, so we can think of uh, operators acting on uh, a localized degree of freedom, very, very tiny. And we have the intuition that uh, the underlying degrees of freedom that um, are the fundamental dynamical variables of the quantum field theory are local. It's like having a local spin at this, at each space-time point, at each space, spatial point. Okay. And so we can we have these operators which are local, and we can, in principle, localize these operators to uh, finite regions, finite subregion. Um, now this is a subregion in space, so this is a region in space. In space. Now of course we also have time, so we should uh, think of let's say space, and then we also uh, have time. Uh, so we we were saying that we localize something. We can think only of op of operators which act. Uh, somehow on this uh, region of space. The operator might be non-local in this region. So you could have a Wilson loop, for example, a Wilson line that uh, involves operators at different positions, or it could be the definition. You could measure an operator which is the product of a, a spin operator here times a spin operator here. That's uh, perfectly allowed, right? What's not allowed is an operator which is a, measures a spin outside, right? That's not allowed. So you have all these operators. It's a, this is a subalgebra of the operator algebra, so you can multiply operators and so on. And furthermore, we uh, know that uh, all the, the, if you have some other local operator here, the locality and causality in quantum field theory tell us that the um, properties of this operator are only determined by uh, what's, go what's going on in the past Lycon, right? So all operators which are in this causal wedge are determined uh, by uh, the data on uh, this surface. So we should think of uh, this operator algebra not, well, we could think of it as a region in space. That's uh, perfectly fine. But uh, we could also think of uh, all the operators in space time, which are localized within uh, this so called causal wedge. So, causal wedge is you take uh, the light sheets that come from uh, the boundary of the region, you take them backwards and forwards, and you consider all the points in the interior. So. Um, okay. So if you had a if you had a field here and you had a, a causal, I mean you have a second order equation, uh, the values uh, relativistic second order equation, the values of the field here would be determined by the values on this region. Um, very good. 
Um, so I said that states are not localized. Um, now the vacuum uh, is, uh, of course the vacuum is just a pure state, so uh, if we took the density matrix of the whole of the vacuum, just that would have zero entropy. But if we consider two subregions, so just the fact that uh, correlation functions, so let's say we have uh, two subregions A and B, so we have a point x here and a point x prime here, you know that the uh, expectation values of the field operator are non-zero, right? So these are non-zero. So this implies that uh, through the bound that we were discussing over there, the bound on the expectation values of operators, there should be a non-trivial mutual information between these two, and in particular, there should be non-trivial entanglement entropies associated to each subregion. Okay. Um, and because this uh, these expectation values can be very large when you take the points very close to each other, you realize that uh, these entanglement entropies will have to be infinite. Okay. Now, strictly speaking, to apply those bounds, uh, I mean, strictly speaking, the norm of a local of an operator of a field operator like this is infinite for two reasons. One is uh, very localized at the point, and the second is that uh, the actual amplitudes of this field are, go from plus to minus infinity. So in order to say this a little better, you would have to integrate the field operator over some region, some small region R, and then put that integral in the exponent, right? So now we get something which is, uh, it has bounded eigenvalues, right? Um, anyway, if you want to apply that argument. But in any case, uh, the final conclusion will be that uh, we expect uh, these entropies to be infinite. Okay. Now, so they are infinite, so something that is infinite is not so well defined. Um, another thing is that uh, really the, the Hilbert space cannot, in the continuum field theory, cannot be dis described, separated into the Hilbert space inside the region and the Hilbert space in the region outside, or a complement. Okay, so this is not strictly valid in the continuum limit. So in the continuum limit, uh, we cannot do this. Um, um, and, however, something we can do, and the, the, the typical approach is to do it in first do a lattice regularization. Um, and then, uh, and then everything is fine, okay? So then you can really divide the Hilbert spaces into the two parts. Um, and then we'll remove the, uh, so the, the, the strategy is first do a lattice regularization, then calculate uh, these entropies, SA for example, and then uh, identify the, the um, divergences that arise when the lattice regulator goes to zero and understand them well enough so that you can remove them, right? So these calculations of entropy are somewhat similar to calculations of any other observable we can, most observables we do in continuum quantum field theory. When you try to compute them naively, you get infinity and you have to be a little more sophisticated to compute something that is finite, okay? And um, so understanding the origin of the divergences is part of understanding how to get something finite out of these things. And the recent, the recent progress has been in trying to understand those finite pieces. Um, okay, so how much? When am I supposed to end? One hour. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, Very good. So, are, are all of the quantities that you're all divergent, or some of them are already finite? Yeah, we'll discuss them. Yeah, so the relative entropy is already finite, and mutual information is already finite. But in order to see why it's finite, I'll need to, uh, let me, that, that's the point I was going to try to explain here. So to understand why they are finite, we need to understand the, um, the divergences a little bit. And today, I, right now, I'm going to just state uh, what the divergences look like. And then we'll probably discuss them in more detail in some more specific cases, just to understand why that is the case. So um, the result, so there is some uh, epsilon will be the ultraviolet cutoff, could be the lattice spacing when we regularize the theory by putting it on a lattice. Um, and 
so here we are considering a region of, in space. So let's say it could be a circle or it could be any shaped region in space. Um, and we are going to calculate the entanglement entropy associated to, or the von Neumann entropy associated to this region. And uh, the first result is that uh, the divergences go like the area of the region, area of the boundary of the region, let's say in a second, to the dimension of space-time minus 2. So this area is the area of the boundary of A. So the boundary of A is uh, this surface here, right? So if space were two-dimensional, as in the blackboard, so we have two dimensions of space, one and two, and in addition we have the time direction that I'm not drawing. So in this case, uh, capital D would be three, and this would be one over epsilon, and this area would be the length of uh, this curve here. Okay, is that clear? Okay. So imagine you are in one plus one dimensions, right? So there's only one direction of space, so that I drew here. And then we have an inter region A is this interval. What do you expect this formula to say? What's the boundary of A? Are these two points, right? So we have two points. And when this is two, this becomes a logarithm of epsilon. So in the particular case of D equal to two, um, we have that S of A uh, will have some divergences. The leading divergences will be the log of epsilon times some coefficient, some number, some uh, times the number of points, number of points in the boundary, number of points. The number of points would be two in this case, but if we had region A where this disconnected region of two intervals, right, we would have a factor of four, right? But the idea is that uh, this coefficient, so especially in this two-dimensional case, is a universal constant we'll discuss later. Um, in uh, the higher dimensional cases, the coefficients, uh, depend uh, more strongly on the cutoff, because if you rescale the cutoff, of course, this number gets rescaled. Uh, here, since uh, the coefficient is of a log, it, it has a more invariant meaning, okay? And we'll, we'll calculate it later. Um, but the impo an important point is that the diversions uh, does not depend on the state that we have. So if we, had the vac if we have the vacuum, we have these diversions with some number. If we keep the same regularization procedure and we consider a state which is not the vacuum, then we'll get exactly the same number, the same diversions. The finite pieces will be different, but the diversions are going to be the same. So this is, yeah. Uh, yeah, so here we are using, uh, a rela so all these things are true in any relativistic quantum field theory. Okay. Yeah, you can have anything that is a quantum field theory. So this uh, does not apply to gravity, for example. So gravity we'll discuss later. But if you have a theory that has gauge fields, uh, matter fields, and so well, gauge fields is a little more tricky, but it also has this property. Um, the, yeah, it's a local quantum. So yeah, yeah, okay. So when I say a relativistic quantum field theory, what I mean is a theory that. Uh, it's what we call local, not, not just causal, but local, that it has a local stress tensor. It has, it's local in the sense that there, it has these localized degrees of freedom that uh, exist at every point and so on. So all the, the, the typical theories we consider in physics are of this kind. So the standard model is of this kind, and the theories that arise in condensed matter physics are of this kind, while the, the ones that are relativistic are of this kind. Um, and those are the theories I'm discussing here. Yes. Ah, sorry, yes. Um, yeah, I'm discussing, here is for any state. So I'm discussing the divergences, and this is true for any state. Uh, yeah. Is it also good for non-Lagrangian theories, like p times zero? Yeah, yeah, so this is supposed not to depend on the Lagrangian. It's supposed to uh, be something completely general. Um, um, Now, in, in condensed matter physics, there is a lot of discussion of area law and so on, and when system can have an area law. Uh, but there, they're interested in the finite pieces. So they have a more, I mean, there is a UV cutoff, which is the atomic scale, and then there will be some finite piece, and they could, the system could have an area law, could not have an area law, and it, it depends on more on the system, okay? Um, so, um, uh, very good. Uh, let's see what I was I going to say. Um, yeah, so we have these uh, diversion terms, 
And in general, the, there is a whole series of diversion terms with less and less powers of epsilon. Um, so in two dimensions, it just stops here and then it's finite. That's for d equal to 2. For d equal to 3, we also get only this term and then something finite. For, for example, for d equal to 4, we also get uh, a term proportional to um, a, a term proportional to curvatures. Let me call them curvatures. It could be the uh, curvature of the space where this is defined, or it could also be the extrinsic curvature of the surface, and so on. Um, that is down by some uh, some powers of epsilon to the d minus four. So for d equal to four, this is a logarithmic term. Okay. And then we go to five dimensions. This would be a 1 over epsilon, and those would be the only two diversion terms. And then we'll have to uh, go on and on. And there's been some characterization of this curvature term. So there could be uh, here various uh, curvature structures uh, involving the various contractions of the extrinsic curvatures and the curvature of the ambient space. But I won't discuss them in detail. But um, all these divergences are. Uh, essentially state independent. It's, what I'm saying is not 100% correct, but uh, let's say to first order correct, like many things we have to first. Uh, um, so there are sometimes some, um, some subtleties in this direction that I want. Yeah. Do you always get uh, 1 over epsilon to d minus 2 and then d minus 4? Yeah, so, you, you, the, yeah, so they, they even, so this, um, yeah, so here we can understand this evenness, let's say if we think in terms of the extrinsic curvature, right? So uh, you might wonder, why don't we get the term which is linear in the extrinsic curvature? The extrinsic curvature, k, would be proportional, let's say if you have a circle here, of direction length l would be for the 1 over l, right? But if we consider the vacuum of the theory, then the sa and sb should be the same, right? Uh, but the extrinsic curvature as viewed from b has the opposite sign. So a term which is odd in the extrinsic curvature cannot appear. Okay. Um, so that's why you don't get here the term which is linear in the extrinsic curvature. We could have uh, only one power of epsilon. Um, and uh, yeah, so so that that gets rid of the odd terms which could only come from the extrinsic curvatures, and um, then Riemann curvatures and so on um, have two two derivatives. So dimensional analysis together with this argument. Uh, says that you have this uh, even expansion. Uh, but of course, if the theory has some other mass scales and so on, they could also appear in here. And you could have a more complicated structure of divergences. This is the simplest situation where, you, let's say, you have a scale invariant theory. Um, um, so when you have other mass scales, they could also, instead of a power of epsilon, you could get the power of the masses and so on. And so you have something a little more complicated. But uh, the basic idea is that um, whatever you have will involve, uh, in this case, curvatures in the most uh, completely correct uh, statement is that it will involve local operators evaluated on this boundary. So that's the most general statement. So when I said that there are some subtleties, I mean, in some cases, you need to have subliving divergences that involve expectation values of local operators on the boundary. They are not important for what we're going to say, so don't worry about those. Um, um, good. Now, the fact that uh, these divergences are state independent implies that the, well, that will imply that the relative entropy is uh, well defined, okay? Because the relative entropy, recall that, well, I erased the formula, but could be viewed as the difference in entropy between the difference in free energy, and difference in free energy is different in energy and entropy, right? Uh, at least for the entropy pieces, it's clear that uh, we um, we have something finite because we are subtracting two uh, infinite quantities. And actually, the relative entropy is really finite, finite. It's the thing that is uh, best defined of, uh, in continuum quantum field theory. Uh, it's relative entropy. Um, the other thing that is finite is uh, mutual information. So we have two regions. So we have, let's see, the definition of mutual information here for A and B. And if we have, um, this is region A, and region B is a disconnected region, so a region that is separated from A, uh, then uh, you find that here in SA you have a divergence which is proportional to the area of A, right? And uh, similarly for SB, and in S of A union B, 
will again get the area of A plus the area of B. So they will cancel. Those diversion terms will cancel in this difference. Okay? So that's something that is finite. So it's something better defined. Okay. Well, I, yeah, also a subleading terms also. Because, uh, yeah, so the reason that they are, uh, they cancel is that, um, well, especially in this case of mutual information, they cancel even if we have, uh, well, if we have curvatures, it's always the integral of some local thing here. And, well, it will have the sum of the, the two terms, right? So, so these terms are not only, yeah, maybe you should have emphasized that. They are not only, um, well, in state independent and it's the area, but this, this area is just the, some local integral over the boundary. So there is the boundary of region A, and we are just integrating square root of g over that uh, boundary, right? So it's the integral of a local quantity along this boundary. And here, again, we're integrating the curvature along the boundary. So the fact that it is this integral uh, makes sure that they cancel. So there is some, some integral here, integral here, they cancel out. Um, OK, so I could finish here. It's a good place to stop, or I could go for uh, 10 more minutes. Why don't we stop and continue the discussion? Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Let's So do so do all the lights.